Hello, and welcome to the third episode now, I guess, Bron, of Wendy the Concierge. Um, happy to see you all today. Today's episode is going to be about finding out that you're probably going to go to prison. That has to be a really hard moment for everybody. I don't think anybody ever is just like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to prison. It's not like that. Um... So if you're here today because you've just found out that you're going to go to prison, I want you to know, first of all, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to be fun. It's going to suck in many different ways, just depending on what's worse for you. But it's not the end of the world. And I'm hoping I can reassure you a little bit and give you a little bit of practical tips and some hope. All right. So one of the first things that I want to talk about is what to do when you find out that things are happening. For some of us, we found out that we were going to prison the day that the cops came in and busted down our front door and put us in handcuffs while they tossed our house. Some of us were then immediately thrown into prison and we didn't come out until the day that we started re-entering society. Others got out on pre-trial a little while later. Some of us just had the government show up and say, hey, we'd like to talk to you about a little something. And it slowly evolved over time where we talked to them about the things that maybe we were involved with. And then eventually they said, oh, and by the way, you're probably going to have to do a little bit of prison time for this. It varies for everybody how they ended up finding out that they were going to go to prison. Um, so first of all, I want to tell you that I'm sorry that this is going to happen to you, but you will most likely be okay. Almost everybody walks out eventually, and it's very rare the person who doesn't end up better off once they're out and done. Because if you're in a position to go to prison, you're doing something wrong, okay? Okay. You're either mobbing, robbing, drugging, and thugging, or you're hanging out with the wrong people that are stealing money or grifting money or doing something wrong with money, all right? So something is going wrong in your life, even if you're living in, like, you know, a nice house in the suburbs and you're a PTA mom and you're sending your kids to school and you've got a nice job and a nice husband and, you know, or a nice wife to whatever. Maybe you're a single mom and you're doing all the right things and you're a pillar of your community, Something is going wrong here. You're messing with the wrong people. You're not watching your business right. Something's going wrong. Okay? And when you go out, come, come back out, you're never going to make that mistake again now, will you? Nope. All right. So let's talk about this. So the overwhelming majority of people who are going to prison are going to prison on drug crimes. That's a fact. So... Maybe you're selling drugs. Maybe you're doing drugs. Maybe both, right? Right. Okay. So, let's talk about that first of all. Let's get that out of the way. All right? If you know perfectly well that the reason that you're being messed with right now is because you're on drugs or selling them, I'm going to take a line straight out of the, you know, what very well known Busted by the Feds book. You need to get yourself into a treatment program and get yourself cleaned up. And not any of this, you know, like 21 to 28 days bullshit either. Okay? You need to get in there for several months. Okay? And, you know, start readjusting your life. If you're saying like, oh, I ain't got time for that. Like, I've got to go to work, you know, and like take care of my kids and stuff. Guess what? You're going to freaking prison. So, you better start now. Okay? Because... At least if you do this, it will probably mitigate the amount of prison time you get. That's if you're already out. Alright? We'll talk about what to do if they don't let you out in a minute. But that's if you're already out. Okay? Now, that's the first thing. But what really should be the first thing, I would think I wouldn't have to say this, but apparently I do because I've met people who... Don't do this. Stop. Whatever you're doing. Okay? If you're selling, 
if you're using stop 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 they're going to watch you you are not smarter than them you are going to get caught if you're screwing around with money you're jacking with people's money okay maybe you're running a ponzi scheme maybe you weren't even intending to run a ponzi scheme okay like maybe you were like selling real estate maybe you're a currency trader i don't know and like maybe just things are out of hand and you start like pulling money from here and there and trying to make things right and it didn't go right and now you've been caught you gotta stop you gotta stop you gotta stop right now done 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 don't do anymore because they get even more mad at you if you keep doing the dumb shit that caused them to be looking at you to begin with gotta stop gotta stop gotta stop gotta stop oh wait before we go any further this is not legal advice okay this is like lifestyle advice just so we're clear because i am not a lawyer so this is not legal advice you talk to your lawyer about that anything i say here you go to your lawyer and say yeah i saw this video where this girl said that maybe i should stop selling drugs while i'm under indictment you think that's a good idea i'm pretty sure your lawyer would say yes but if you want to take it as legal advice you better ask your lawyer first right right all right so that's some of where to start with so now i want to address the people that are up on money crimes all right so i was not up on the money crime do I look like I went to prison for a money crime? <laughs> okay, but all of my best friends were people who went to prison on money crimes. They were fantastic and they are still my best friends, all right? And I know you you didn't do it. You didn't mean to do it. Everybody who's ever been arrested for a money crime says, oh, it wasn't me. You know, y'all shaggy. Like, it wasn't me knocking on the bank door. No, it wasn't you. No, 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 Okay, so uh, I'm done teasing you for a little bit, but for real. None of y'all did it. You all so innocent. Okay, I met a few did, but by and large, most of them will never admit it. All right, fine. So, if you're up on a money crime, you gotta stop what you're doing too. You gotta like look good. All right. Don't be like going on like large trips. Don't be like spending like all kinds of freaking money everywhere. It's just it's not a good look. All right. You gotta like wind it down. Okay. Another thing is that if you're arrested on a money crime, by and large, most likely, you're not going to be locked up during your pretrial. It's pretty rare that they lock you up on pretrial when you're down for a money crime. Um, so while you're out on pretrial, make sure that you're following the rules. Like, and this is a really obvious rule to say, but I know somebody who jacked themselves up like this one time. So, um, I'm sorry if this sounds too obvious, but I'm not being patronizing here. I'm being serious. Don't leave the country. Okay? No. You need to stay home. Okay? You need to stay home. You need to be where they can see you. You need to talk to them all the time. Don't give them lip and don't give them attitude. Be glad that you're outside because a lot of people are locked up for their free trial time. All right. So, back to, like, the general audience now. Okay? That was specific for money crime and drug crime people. So, you've realized that you're probably going to go to prison. Because most people who are indicted do go to prison. Alright? It's going to happen. Okay. So, the first thing that I'm here to tell you, and I'm addressing the ladies here primarily. Although this, generally speaking, affects the men as well. Okay? First thing that I'm going to tell you is that you will most likely not be beat up. You will very most likely not have to fight okay there's so many women who came to uh danbury when i was there and they would come and they were just scared to death you know these middle-aged like white ladies that were like you know just from the birds or whatever and you know maybe they did a little drugs now and then or maybe they like you know embezzled a little money from like the pta or something all right but they weren't like thug life type chicks right and they come in they were just scared to death that they were just gonna get beaten or raped by their fellow bunkie or something you know and because they watched all these scary as fuck videos on youtube by these guys talking and then now hold up i need to interject something here if you're in california don't listen to nothing i say because california is a whole different country when it comes to prison culture and stuff 
I don't know nothing about that. Although I've been told that the federal prisons, particularly for the women there, are not anywhere nothing like their state prisons. And they are much more akin to the rest of the country's federal prisons. But, no, for the most part, you're not going to have to fight or anything like that. Unless you're running your mouth. Okay, let's talk about the fight thing. Um, the fight thing. Okay. The only time that I've ever seen anybody get fucked up in prison, okay, is because they were running their mouth, just like talking all kinds of nonsense and acting like a know-it-all in the TV room. Oh, speaking of that. Trying to run the TV. Don't try to run the TV. Just give up on the TV. It's not yours. No. You will know when you get to prison who runs the TV. It's not you. Just don't try. Okay? The other way that people get in fights in prisons is if they snitched. That's a thing. Yeah. They generally don't, like, girls, like, we don't check each other's papers when we come in. We do not care that you snitched on your boss for stealing $100 million. No one gives a fuck, all right? Like, just don't worry about it. You're not going to get a, you're beat up for snitching on your boss for that, all right? You're fine. Okay. Now, the other thing that people get snitched on with, for snitching, though, is, like, if the person you snitched on is there... Or, like, if you snitch on somebody there, like, if you go and you say, Officer, this person's drinking. Uh-uh, don't, don't do that. It's not your business. Those officers get paid damn near six-figure salaries when you consider all of their benefits and stuff. And they get a sweet retirement package. And you don't need to do their job for them. They're paid very well to do their job. Don't do it for them. Okay. That's one. Snitching. Yeah. You can get beat up for that. But the primary way that women get beat up in prison is because of the same reason that women get beat up outside of prison. Because they're fooling around with somebody, okay? So either you come in and your boyfriend's wife is there and she wants to fuck you up but good, okay? I've seen that go down a couple of times. More than a couple, honestly. Or for some reason, I, I wasn't into this scene there are a lot of women who, when they get into prison, they get a girlfriend, okay? And there are a lot of uh, women in prison who present more masculinely. Some of them are straight up trans dudes, okay? And in prison, they don't classify you by how you identify. They don't classify you by your gender identity. They classify you by what is between your legs, period, end of sentence. So if you're a trans dude who hasn't had a surgery to get male parts below, you're going to end up in the chick's prison. Even though you may have a full beard and like look like you can bench me and three of my similarly sized friends all at the same time, you're going to be with the girls and you're going to be popular. Okay? And they're going to fight each other over you. And it's the weirdest thing that I've ever seen because I, I don't want a relationship in prison. Listen, I, I gotta be real with you here. I don't really object to the idea of having a girlfriend. But I don't want a girlfriend in prison. And more specifically, I don't want an ex-girlfriend in prison. Mm. Like, it's bad enough when you break up with somebody when you're on the outside. And, like, you know, you, maybe you gotta see them at school. Maybe you gotta see them at work. Maybe you gotta see them at your local social hangout. Or... You know, you got to see me at your kid's graduation because you share a kid together, right? Okay, now you're in prison. You got to see them every freaking meal. You sleep down the freaking hall from them. You got to shower with them still. Fuck that, man. Uh-uh, 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 No, I don't want to be involved in all that. You don't want to be involved in that either. And I wouldn't want that in my life if, like, prison was co-ed. I can't imagine what a disaster a co-ed prison would be. But just, just for the sake of this argument, imagine. It's not like a homophobic thing that I'm saying that. It's that I, I don't want a relationship when I'm in prison. Like, um, there's too much going on. There's no space. There's no privacy from anyone. Just everybody's in your freaking business. You don't. It's a shit show. Don't get involved in that. Okay? All right. So those are the ways that people fight when they get into prison. People don't, generally speaking, beat you up just because you happen to be white. Okay? I never once saw that. 
Uh uh-uh. uh. And I was in like four different facilities in various states, various parts of the country, with various levels of prisoners. I never saw somebody get their ass beat just for the sin of being of any particular ethnicity. That did not happen. Okay. Um. So don't do that. And then, oh, and there is one other way that I've seen fights go down, and that's over bad business. Okay. So let's say that like you hire Susie to crochet you a blanket for your kids for Christmas, and uh, Susie crochets a beautiful blanket, and. Uh, you don't have the money for whatever reason to put on Susie's cash app. You still don't have it. And you still don't have it a week later and a week later and a week later and it goes by and you keep saying, oh yeah, my people are going to put it on your cash app. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eventually, Susie might want to fuck you up. Okay? So, pay your bills. Don't contract for services, whether that be getting a pedicure, having somebody who makes your bed every day and irons your uniforms. Don't contract for these services if you can't afford to pay them. Another thing you don't do, some of us are smokers, right? Thank you, Jesus. I have not smoked since, like, 2009, something like that. Maybe, like, a haul here and there, but, like, I, I have not smoked a full cigarette to myself for well, well, well over a decade didn't even start when I was in prison, thank God. And that's really lucky because a single cigarette is anywhere from 10 to $15. Usually three for 25 That's in the women's, okay? The men can sell them as much as like $25 for half a cigarette because the men will take the filters off and cut the sticks in half, sell like one of them little halves for like 25 bucks, right? It is really easy to have a cigarette habit that turns into costing a lot of money. I know girls who owed like anywhere from like a hundred to three hundred dollars. You know, sell a pack of cigarettes for like a hundred, hundred and twenty bucks. That goes real quick, you know? Even if like people contribute or whatever. It's easy to get messed up. It's buzz that if you're gonna buy these kind of services, pay for them in advance. And don't get yourself in too deep. The good sellers, contractors there, you know, that are selling services and goods, they won't let you get in too deep. But I've seen girls have like, even like a five, six hundred dollar bill for cigarettes. Cigarettes, people. I'm talking about cigarettes. Which brings me to a list of things that you want to do before you go to prison. All right. So, you know you're going to prison. There are certain things that you need to get in order, okay? Your money, your property, your children, and you, your physical self, all right? So, your money. Make sure you've got money set aside, like in a bank account. Maybe just put it, like, in a savings account so it can sit there, grow interest, and wait for you until you get out. Hopefully, you have somebody, like a partner or a spouse, to watch it. And baby, I hope that you really can trust that person. Because let me tell you, I know so many women who went to prison and they left their money with their man. They left their money with their bitch. And they got out and they had spent all of it. Even like their sisters, man. Like, it's not good. So if you can just leave it and not have anybody mess with it, set up auto payments, whatever. I don't know. But like, the less people you have dipping into your fondage, the better. If you still have a house that's going to be made payments and you know you're going to be away for years and years, you probably want to sell it, frankly. Or get a property management company to rent it out for you. But just leaving it empty, if you're going to be gone for very long, you maybe should see some property advice on that. Okay? Another thing, you want to have your money set aside, but also, you're about to go to prison for a while. You're going to want some money on your books. When you first get there, just to get yourself some clothing, some recreational wear, like some shorts, some t-shirts, some sweatpants, things to feel comfortable in, some exercise clothing, some tennis shoes, shower shoes, a little bit of food and comfort from home, some sodas. 
some candy bars, that sort of thing. Honestly, for the first two months you're there, you're, you're probably going to want to spend like three to $500 just on crap like that. And that ain't to say nothing of the phone bill and the email bill and all of that kind of crap, right? Right. Okay. So one thing that some people do is once they find out what their prison number is going to be, you can put money on your own books before you even show up to self-surrender. That's one of the gifts that people have. All right? So that's something that you can do. You can go ahead and put that on there. That's right. Okay. You want to make sure your kids are taken care of. This is the hard part. This is the really crappy and hard part. I was extraordinarily lucky in that my minor children have a wonderful stand-up man as a father. He was fantastic throughout this entire process and stood by me like nobody's business. He didn't let anybody insult me to his kids, and he took good care of me and made sure that I continued to have a relationship with our children. Alright? Those kind of men are worth their weight in gold. Because let me tell you, a lot of men will cut off the mother from her children. And that's if they're with their daddy, okay? If they're with grandma, a sister, a friend, you gotta make sure that you trust these people to take care of your baby right. Sometimes you might wanna place them in an adoption situation if you're gonna be gone for a very long time. That might be the right choice. That doesn't mean that you're not their mother anymore. A piece of paper doesn't mean anything. But you've got to think of what's in the best interest of those kids. Not every adoption is closed. And not every adoption is open. And sometimes when they say that an adoption is open, it ends up being closed. It's really not easy. So you need to make sure that your babies are taken care of. Now you may decide that you want a friend to take care of your kids. You know, somebody who's been like a sister to you your whole life. That's great. Make sure that you check with your legal advisors to set up the proper legal documentation for this. Because I know people who left their kids with their friends while they went to prison for a little while. And as soon as they got into prison, the grandma, the aunts, whoever tried to sue for custody and cause all kinds of drama with social services and stuff because they thought they should be taking care of the kids because they were family. Now let me tell you, if you don't put your babies with your mama or your sister, I know why and you know why. It's probably a damn good reason, right? Right. So make sure that your buddy or whoever you leave your babies with that you know is a good person to take care of your babies you make sure that you got the legal documentation set up so that they can have full rights and that it's enforced by custodial arrangements, okay? You should probably consult a lawyer about this. Make sure you get it taken care of. Don't leave it to the last minute. Also, depending on where you are, even if you're going to leave the kids with your husband or your wife, all right, make sure you get your legal documentation set up so that they don't need to come to you to sign for things. For example, uh, the father of my younger children, he needed to have some paperwork done so that he could fill out my children's passport information on his own, so that he could sign off on the medical procedures, and so that he could even take them on vacations out of the country without my permission. Because he couldn't do that with me being in prison because I had to sign off as well because we both have custody of our children. Okay? So you need to make sure that these things are arranged. All right. So you need to take care of the property, the money, the kids, and you. Well, I've spoken about property like your house, right? There's another kind of property that you need to take care of. You need to take care of your stuff. Like your clothes. You need to take care of like your computer equipment. You need to take care of your jewelry. All right. Now, here's the thing. 
you might want to hang on to all that stuff, but especially like your heirlooms, I definitely advise that. One thing that a lot of people do is they'll get a small storage unit and then they'll put all that stuff in there and they'll prepay it for like a couple years or however long they're going to be gone. If you have the money for that, that's fantastic. If you leave it with friends, well, I'm going to tell you this. Prepay it in advance. Don't depend on your friends to pay it because I know people who depended on their friends to pay it. And then you know what happened? The friends didn't pay it and all their stuff got jacked. It was gone. All right. Don't do that. Ideally, you can leave your stuff with a friend or a family member who will take proper care of it for you and it will be waiting for you when you get out. That's the best way to do it. However, you may not be able to have that luxury. I understand that. And you may not be able to have the money to afford to put it all in storage either. At which point, get your heirlooms together and the things that are precious to you. Truly precious. You know, the photos of your babies. The date books from your great-grandmother. You know, uh, your yearbooks from 20, 30 years ago. You know, get that all aside and get that with somebody you trust with your life. All right? Get that to them. Okay? The rest of it, sell it. Get rid of it. Forget it. Because when you come out in a year or two, hopefully, hopefully it's not 5, 10, 15 years, but even then especially, you're not going to want those clothes. You're probably not even going to be that size because everybody who goes to prison, they either gain weight or they lose weight. So you're going to want to do something else when you get out. And those clothes won't even be fashionable anymore. And it's going to remind you of a life that you never had, it, that you no longer have. It's gone. So get rid of it. It's not even worth keeping. Unless, like, you're going to leave your home and then come back to it. Okay. You're very lucky if you can do that. A lot of people can't, especially women. All right. So you got to take care of your stuff. Now, then there comes to taking care of you. Are you a smoker? Okay. I talked about this earlier. But for real, quit smoking before you go in. I know, you're stressed. This is, like, not the time that you think that you can quit. I'm telling you. You can. All right? God, I have the worst allergies tonight. I'm sorry. It's crazy. Allergies are crazy right now here. Um, because it's late spring. Anyway. Um, you gotta quit smoking. Go to your doctor. Get get on the Nicorette or Chimanix or whatever that crap is called now. Like, get off it. All right? Get done with that. You don't want to be racking up huge smoking bills when you go into prison. It just sucks. And believe me, there will be people there who smoke. You're going to smell it. You're going to notice it. And you're going to want it. So, because I'm telling you, like, I would even be like, like, when I was in prison, facts here, okay? I was an opiate addict. I did heroin, oxy, everything else, all right? I wanted nothing to do with that once I finally got clean and sober, right? To this day, I smell a cigarette and I'm like, and I quit smoking, like I said, like 12 years ago. But I still think of it. Okay. So, you, you want to, you don't want to be an active smoker when you go into prison. That's just going to be miserable. It's going to cost you money you don't have and that your family's not going to want to pay. Fuck that. Get rid of that. Mm -mm. Get it off the smoking. Okay. In a similar vein, if you're somebody who's on methadone, suboxone, any of that crap, okay. I got no ill will against medicated assisted treatment. None whatsoever. It's not for me. But if that's how you get sober and you get off the illegal substances, good for you. More power to you. I support you entirely in finding your own way. I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. Okay? So I, there's no judgment here on that. That said, the overwhelming majority of prisons are not going to support your habit. So you're going to get to the front door and you're going to get admitted and then you're going to have to go through a draw. And hopefully you'll have a nice place that gives you like Tylenol, Librium, and whatever other crap they give you to help you come down from it, right? More than likely, you're just going to be crawling on the floor and wishing that you were dead. So, and I say that as somebody who went through withdrawal when I was arrested. I spent six weeks on a cold cement floor in Douglas County Corrections in Omaha, Nebraska, wishing that I was dead. And I still remember the morning that I woke up and I no longer was owned by that crap. <sighs> Best feeling ever. Ever. Ever going back. I promise you that. 
So get off that stuff because you are most likely not going to be able to have it. There was a girl who was at uh, Danbury and her lawyer actually like fought in court for her to be able to write, have the right to continue her methadone treatment. And Danbury actually took her out every morning to the local methadone clinic to get it, right? Because they didn't even have anybody authorized there to disperse methadone. Because you can't just, it's not just being a doctor or a nurse to disperse methadone. You have to go through all this specific training to do it. And they didn't have it. Okay, fine. So they took her out, but she had to fight and get a lawyer to fight for her to do that. And then on top of it, get up every freaking morning at 5 a.m., get dragged out of there and taken to the clinic. You, you don't want to fuck with this. Just get off it. Taper down. Bye. Done. Okay. And I strongly suggest starting an exercise fitness program so that when you get into prison and start exercising you'll have something to do because that's one thing that you can do to keep your time occupied. You can spend your time in the gym, stay on the treadmill. It'll keep you out of trouble and it'll keep you from hooking up with the prison pharmacy underground because you don't need to be getting involved in that either because that's a good way to catch a whole new charge and add a bunch more time to your sentence. Stay off that nonsense. You don't want nothing to do with that. It's not what's up. All right. And don't think that just like, Oh, you're going to get in and go to RDAP and like, you know, RDAP, for those of you who don't know, is the residential drug and alcohol program that the Bureau of Prisons runs. Don't think that you're going to get into that right away and then you won't be involved with it. Because let me tell you, some of the biggest pharmacy high rollers are sitting in those RDAP classes and they will come at you and sell it you because they already know, by definition, you're an RDAP, you want what they got. All right? This is not the lifestyle you want to be rolling with. you got to make a commitment that you're going to go in there and stay out of doing it. Anything that can get you into any kind of trouble because it's not worth it and you will get caught more likely than not. Okay? So, there we go. Get off of that stuff. Here's some other ways you're going to want to take care of yourself before you go in, right? And, again, my, my advice usually obviously goes more towards the ladies because I am one. But it goes for the guys as well, all right? And this is one that applies equally to all genders. Get yourself a quality dental exam and cleaning before you go in because you're not going to get one for at least a year when you go inside. They may look at you, and if, if you've got a tooth that's problematic, yeah, they'll take care of it. They'll pull it, okay? They're not going to, like, fill you, give you crowns and shit like that. Uh-uh, they're just going to yank that damn thing. No. So you go and you get any work done that you need. You get your dentures, you get everything pulled, you get implants if you need implants, all that crap, okay? Get up to date and moving, all right? Also, you're gonna, if you're on any kind of like psychiatric medicine, let's say like you're on antidepressants, let's say you're medicated for bipolar, um, let's say that like you've got uh, schizoaffective disorders, you know, and maybe you're on some antipsychotics, I don't know. Um, I, I don't take those kind of medications, but I know a lot of people do. Okay. You want to check and have your doctor check with you what your particular prison, whether you're going to state, the feds, whatever, is going to allow and what they have and what they will fill for you. Okay. Because the last thing you want is you show up with your medication that day when you're being taken in. And they say, yeah, you can't have this here. No, no, you can't have this. No, that's not a thing here. Because I know people have had it and then they've had to go through a thrall and go through the pain in the ass of getting a different kind of medication assigned to them. Okay? So make sure you, your medications are BEOP or whatever prison you're going to compatible. Now, here's another thing that I'm going to tell you. So I cannot tell you the amount of people that I have seen who came to prison wearing their contact lenses and they said that they saw on the BOP website that they could come in with their contact lenses. Yet, yeah, no, you can't. I don't know why they say that, but you can't. You can bring your glasses. These, yeah, you can bring those. Mm -hmm. um, you, they also say to bring your prescriptions with you. No. You can't bring your prescriptions. I don't know why they tell you that. Maybe you can at other prisons, but I know you sure the hell can't at Danbury, all right? Uh, they'll just say mm, thank you and throw them in the trash. And it'll be several days before you get your medications, 
Okay, you're gonna have to be prepared to throw an absolute fit to get your medications. They're not gonna start you right away on them. It just sucks. And it's not because they hate you. It's not because they don't give a damn. It's not because they're trying to kill you. It's because they're overworked and understaffed and they do not have the resources or supplies in order to make it happen. It's a shame, but our prisons aren't funded properly, actually. They're just really not. There's only so much they can do with where their hands are and the resources and tools that they have. It sucks. So I'm just preparing you in advance for that. All right. So, yeah. So get the U ready. Now, for the ladies, when you go in, a lot of women, for some reason, think that they want to cut their hair off short so that they have something easy and simple to care for when you go into prison. I guess. But most women find out pretty quickly that actually having longer hair is easier because everybody just ties their hair up months ago. When I first went into prison, I had like an asymmetrical bob that was up to here um, because I had cut out a bunch of knots that were in the back of my hair the previous summer. Okay, Other than a slight trim to even out the ends as it was growing out, I haven't cut my hair since 2017 in the summer. My hair is now, I can sit on it when it's untied and down. Okay, It's really, really long. And... It needs to be layered desperately, but, you know, people were going in and out all the time, so we never really had a consistent hair care person there. Once our main hairdresser left, and the people we did have were always busy all the time. We only have, like, little tiny scissors to cut with. I thought I was going to get out any moment. I thought that once I got out, I would go to the hairdressers, but it's COVID, and then, you know, I've got to spend my money on other things, that not my house and my car, my job, my life. You know, so I didn't really have time for hair stuff. So I, it's just it's like it keeps growing and growing and growing. You know, it's like this long chestnut mane. So, you know, there we go. Um, I miss getting it done up in braids. I miss my Puerto Rican hairstylist. She used to do the best braids on me. It was fantastic. That was my indulgence in prison was getting my hair braided. Oh, yeah. Speaking of indulgences in prison. We all like a little bit of pampering now and then. And you'll find people there who know how to like do nails, who will do pedicures, who will do your hair for you, put your hair in braids. They'll iron your clothes, they'll wash your sheets, make your bed for you and that sort of thing. And that's all good and cool, you know. We all like to feel like a little bit of comfort here and there, right? Right. But I was one of these people where I felt a little guilty asking my family to put money on my books so I could get my nails done. You know, or like even to have my hair braided, like just felt kind of guilty about it. So, what I found out that I could do is that I know how to sew. So I would help people fix like their uniforms up because when they give us these uniforms, they're giant and boxy, and they're supposed to hem you up when you first come in. That's where the phrase like "Oh, I got hemmed up," you know, comes from. That they hem your pants up to your length when you come in. Okay, I don't know if other prisons are still doing that, but Danbury ain't doing that no more. They just give you your pants and you're supposed to roll them or cut them off or some shit. I don't even know. And, like, they're totally straight legs. So, at the bottom, you know, they're practically, like, bell bottoms. So, I learned how to sew and how to tailor those pants. And, you know, in exchange for this service, people would, like, do my hair. Technically, this is against the rules. Because, you know, they don't want to be monitoring fights between inmates. You know, like, oh, she did this and she did that and she owes me this and she owes me that. You know, it would turn into all kinds of drama. So they just tell you, well, you ain't even supposed to be engaging in that activity anyway. But the reality is that humans do things for one another and these sort of things happen. And there is an exchange there. And as long as everybody's civilized adults about it, nobody cares. All right? Right. Now, I do warn you about that. If you pull that shit in RDAP, they will throw you out of RDAP for that. So don't pull it there. There's even, you know, the infamous incident that everybody heard about, like, in, in Greenville. And I want to say that this doesn't happen all that often, and that's why everybody's heard about this legend. But, you know, say you want to make a cheesecake. So, like, I buy the creamer, you know, and, uh, you know, Shelly here buys the strawberry cookies for it. And uh, Mary over there buys the milk, you know, and we all put in and 
as you can tell, by the way, those of you who are prison cooks, I never cooked a meal in my life in prison. <laughs> all my other girlfriends did that for me while I sewed their clothes. I would buy the food, but they could all cook it for me. I was not a prison cook at all. I'm a real cook outside. I can cook a hella good meal for you outside, but I did not do prison cooking. That was not my thing. So, all right. So, all these girls got together, you know, they each contributed, you know, and then they made a cheesecake and they all got kicked out of our dad because apparently that's like criminal thinking to all like go in together. I guess like every freaking potluck dinner at some church basement in the Midwest is criminal gateway there, right? Like get the fuck out of here. These people suck. Um, so yeah, like you gotta be careful when you're engaging in that kind of activity. I'm just telling you that it's one of the things that works. Okay. So Get your hair cut and fixed up before you go in so that you've got something you feel comfortable with. But if I were you, if you're somebody who dyes your hair a lot, okay, get it back to as close to your natural color as possible. Or just let it go back completely natural. Because more likely than not, the colors that they have for hair dye aren't really going to fit what you want. Like, they don't have, like, the whole giant roster of colors that they do out here. There's usually one red color, one dark brown color, one black color, and one blonde color. And the likelihood that it's going to be your shade is very low. So just get your hair back to your regular color and you'll feel a lot more comfortable and that way you won't even have to dye it. That's how I ended up with my hair like this because, you know, it, I just let it go back to its natural color because I got arrested the first time. And I had a feeling I was going to get arrested, you know, pretty hardcore for the big show soon. And actually, one of the things that I thought of was I'm going to dye my hair back to my natural color so that when I go away, I don't have to have like, you know, a f six inches of roots coming out. That, by the way, is an example of classic addict thinking right there. You know, here I am getting arrested and engaging in the kind of activity that's going to put me in prison. Do I stop my activity? Oh, hell no. Instead, I grow my hair out and dye it so that, you know, when I go to prison, I don't have to fuck with my roots. Are you serious right now? That's terrible. What was wrong with me? All I can say is I wasn't sober yet. Now, I would stop. Well, now I wouldn't be in that position to begin with. I just don't do that anymore. I'm not doing anything to get me anywhere near prison anymore. Nope. Not my speed. Anyway, I digress. So... Get your hair in order and that sort of thing. Now, another thing that I need to warn you about, this is for the ladies and the men, but I'm thinking of primarily from the women's angle. When you get to prison, your razor use is going to be restricted. Okay? Depending on the security level of the prison that you're at, we'll show where the razors are. You might have access to just plain disposable razors. You might only be able to access them once a week under supervision. When I was in county, during lockdown time in the afternoon, if you asked for a razor, you could have one, and you had to shave in yourself and use like your sink and soap for water. It was a pretty miserable experience. The razors, like I said, when I was in county, they were just classic disposable razors. These weren't like, you know, the Mach 5 with like, you know, six different heads or whatever and like razor sharp stuff and refillable blade stuff. That came later at Danbury. But, you know, when you're in county facilities and when you're traveling, like at the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City, it's all disposable all the way. Okay. So you may want to invest in some laser hair removal. It's a good thing. Let me tell you, I've never been more appreciative in my life as when I got to prison that I had had laser hair removal. I always enjoyed my laser hair removal, but when I got to prison, I was like, damn, Wendy, that was smart. Lucky you. So, yeah, I have my laser hair removal, and I'm really glad that I did. And if you've got the means to get laser hair removal prior to going to prison, I really recommend it so that then you don't even have to fuck with the razors because let me tell you, it is a pain in the ass. All right. So, and then there are all the myriad hodgepodge of things 
all right, such as like your magazine subscriptions, your Netflix, your Hulu, and all that that you're going to need to stop. And when you first get to prison, all right, if you're transferring and that sort of thing, don't even mess with getting your subscriptions for your magazine stuff set up until you get to your permanent home prison because they're not going to follow you from facility to facility and you're just going to be changing them over and over and it's just, it's not even worth it. Don't do it. Okay. All right. So then another thing that you're going to probably want to set up is a phone number where right now most of the facilities are giving free phone calls because COVID because they can't have visitation. Whoop, whoop. That's fabulous. Because let me tell you, they gouge you for those phone calls. All right. So one thing that you can do that's very helpful is to set up a phone number for like, let's face it, most of us don't call like 75 different people in prison. We call like a mom, we call her boyfriend or girlfriend, we call her kids. All right. Set them people up, especially the one that you call the most. All right. With a number that's local the prison that you're going to so that your long distance charges are greatly minimized all right there are several services you can get that just move the number to it and sort of forward it you can't do direct call forwarding when you call from a prison phone on a lot of them but these services where you call a specific number usually do work so you'll want to do that and you'll also want to, on that note, compile a sheet of contacts, okay, of all the people whose email and phone number and address you're going to want to have when you're in prison, all right? Have that sheet con like compiled and ready to go so that when you go, you can take out a printout of that sheet with you or you can have somebody mail it to you if they don't even let you bring in a printout because some places don't let you bring nothing with you, okay? And some places, if you're lucky, your person on the outside, you can just keep one email address in your head and they can email the whole list to you once you actually get in. That's super handy like that. Right? Right. Make a whole list of books that you want to read when you get in. Okay? Make sure that they're soft cover because most places won't let you have a hardcover book. Some places do, especially the camps. They, they often will let you have hardcover books. But many of them won't. And one other thing I want to remind you of, when you're sending books to somebody from uh, to somebody who's in prison, they need to come from an authorized seller like Barnes & Noble or Amazon. And watch it on Amazon because it has to come from Amazon, not from like Suzy Q, who's an Amazon seller. All right? You can't be doing that. Okay. Because they'll just <laughs> right out of there. All right. So you need to have all that. All right. So these are the things that you need to do before you're going into the prison. Now, the biggest thing that I can tell you is before you go to the prison, don't spend every day thinking, oh my God, I'm going to prison. Oh my God, I'm going to prison. Oh my God, I'm going to prison. My life is over. Don't do that to yourself. Enjoy every last minute that you have. Go to the beach, like, you know, like, spend time with your partner, like, spend time with your kids, watch a movie, you know, binge on your favorite show on Netflix, eat really good food, all right, because you're not going to have a lot for a while, even in the best places, the food isn't really anything to write home about. You know what I'm saying? It's not. You're not going to like that. You know, enjoy your last day. Spend time with your family, with your friends. Eat well. Live well. Enjoy yourself. Play with your animals. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. If you're going to be going to prison, you need to make arrangements for your animals. If they can just stay in your house with your family while you're gone, you're very lucky. All right? A lot of people, you're going to have to give your animals away. And if you have an elderly animal and you're going to be gone for a while, you may have to accept the fact that your animal is going to pass while you are gone. 
That's tragic and it's awful. I know many ladies who lost their favorite dog while they were in prison and it devastated them that they were not there for this event and that they never got to hold their dog again or their cat, you know, their guinea pig. I know somebody who lost a hedgehog. She was just crushed. I know somebody whose elderly parrot died. They were devastated because they thought that parrot was going to live forever. And sometimes people run into the unfortunate circumstance where their family and friends do not care for their pet properly. And I'm very sorry if this happens to you. So please try to make sure that your animals are taken care of, you know? Like, because you got to set that up for them. Hopefully you'll be able to be reunited with them once your time of incarceration is done. But the reality is you probably will not. Okay, um, I don't even know how to, like, it's just an awful thing. I, I lost two very beloved dogs when I was arrested. My animals were taken to the Humane Society. I did not have time to make arrangements for them. I did not have family that was willing to take them in. I know that my animals were adopted. That gives me some comfort. I know that when their new people took them to the vet, the vet would have looked at their x-rays and said, wow, I can tell you that these animals were very loved because my animals would have had evidence of extensive surgeries and dental work done on them. So I hope that they had great lives with their people. But I never got to see them again. I'll never know what actually happened to them. That sucks. So make sure that your animals are taken care of as well. It's important. Okay? Alright. So these are some things to do when you face in prison. Alright? If you've got any questions about specifics, about logistics, about figuring out situations local to your area, go ahead and hit me up down below. That's wendytheconcierge at gmail.com. And if you like the advice that I give and stuff, you can hit me up on my coffee account, which is also linked below. And uh, once again, I never withhold information on the basis of payment. People are welcome to throw money at me, whether or not I give them information or advice, or if you just think that I perform a good service, I appreciate all your tips and tricks. All right, all right. So please go ahead and hit me up below. Let me know if you have any specific questions. And I will be very happy to help you out. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know uh, if you've got any specific subjects you would like me to touch on. I will tell you now that our next episode is going to be about what to do when you are actually in prison. What is your life in prison going to be like? All right. And I've done some research with the boys about this as well. So I can give some information for our guys who are watching. Most of it, obviously, is going to center on the ladies. And obviously, I'm going to have more of a federal bent. But I know a lot about state time, too. And many of the same uh, suggestions apply to the situations, whether you're in a federal situation or a state situation. So a lot of this information is all useful to applicable. That's the word I'm looking for to every situation. All right. So thank you for tuning in tonight. And I hope to see you soon for our next episode of Wendy the Concierge. Bye for now. Thank you.